today, I'll be reading Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Again, that's Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. And it reads, This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was, was a righteous man, did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet. The virgin will, will be with child and will give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Good morning. It's great to have everyone here today, being able to worship God. Thanks for leading the singing, Mike. I appreciate that. So we're talking about God with us and what that really means. And I think it's being able to see God and how he comes out in our life. Not too long ago, we uh, asked you guys to bring some presents. There were cards that were given out and we had picked some of the poorest families from Lowell Elementary School. They recommended them, and uh, you guys did a great job. You went out and brought presents in for them. They're all wrapped. They're all ready. And so next Sunday night, we're going to go deliver those. And so if you would like to come at 5 o'clock and be in on that, whether you brought a present or not, that does not matter. It's, we want to go as a church and just be able to say to them, here, this is just from us. And you don't have to go in. They're not going to offer you hot chocolate. There is no sleigh bells. There is no other thing that goes to you because it's not about you. But they might like to put a face with who's giving them these things. And so if you want to see how all that works out, we'll be here next Sunday night at 5. And so that should be a great thing. Don't worry, it's perfectly safe. No problem with that. There will be several people who are going. As we look at the birth of Jesus, one of the things that I wanted to try and emphasize, and we'll do this again next week, but is this idea that God is with us because they literally name him that. It's from the prophecy, Isaiah 7, 14, that God is with us. His name is Emmanuel. God with us. And they've known this for a long time, that his name would be God's with you. And since they know that God's with you, then that's what the name is. And so that seems to be important. And if God is with you, then everything will be smooth and perfect, right? No, it does not work that way. Nothing goes smooth when God is with you. Now, we always think of it the other way, but it seems like if you can pick a prophet that had the perfect life, then maybe we could get that theory. But for some reason, that theory does not work with any character that I know of in the Bible. Their lives are complicated. Their lives have difficulty. Sometimes they have extreme difficulty. Uh, this one's a little bit difficult. He's got to try, and it would be probably much easier today since there's not a stigma for being pregnant and uh, not being married. Back then, that was huge. You didn't do that. And all of a sudden, he's tried to do everything right and tried to do everything he possibly can to have respect for Mary, to have everyone understand who they are. And she turns up pregnant. And she has the wildest story. I mean, really... I thought I knew her better than this. Why would she tell me a story like that? Really, that God did it? Uh, I've heard people say, the devil made me do it, but that God actually did it, this just does not 
but I don't want to embarrass her. I don't want to cause her any problem. And so out of consideration for her, which I think is very, very interesting as you begin to look at this whole thing, out of consideration for her, I'm just going to quietly back out of this whole thing. What about consideration for him? Doesn't he have to look good? Doesn't he have to say, I didn't do this, not my fault. I don't know what she was thinking. No. He says, you know what, I'll just take it all and I will just be quiet. And he was unwilling to put her to shame. Interesting that, you know, if you are engaged, it takes a divorce to break an engagement back then. He said, I will divorce her quietly. Today, we may not think it's such a tragedy, but it was a tragedy for them, a genuine tragedy. It's either tragedy or it's God's favor, right? So which one do we have? And usually, sometimes both of those are the same. I don't know that Joseph could see what was happening. I don't know that he quite understood. The facts didn't change. An angel comes and appears to him in a dream. And it looks like he was thinking about it and he fell asleep, you know, while he was pondering these things and then the next thing he woke from the dream. Well, it looks like, it gives me hope because sometimes when I'm, thinking about things and maybe praying to God about things. I don't wake in a dream, but I wake. And uh, God and I have been talking for a long time. He's been on hold. But as you think about this, an angel has come and an angel has said to him, I don't want you to be afraid of this. I don't want you to be embarrassed about it. I don't want you to not understand, but I want you to know who Mary is. Mary's the one who is doing everything for God. And this is from God. And as you look at what he tries to tell him, he's trying to tell him, Mary told you the truth. Don't be afraid to take her as your wife because she has not cheated on you. She has not done anything against you. There is no shame. There is no sin. No matter what it sounds like. And how would you explain that to anybody else? Guess what? We're pregnant by God. It just isn't going to work, is it? And so he's got to see and to realize something that is different about his life than everybody else. And he cannot explain it. Because who would ever believe that? There's just no way possible and they even named him. It's Emmanuel. It's God with us. And he's told specifically, call him Jesus. Don't even get to pick out the name. But God is with them. God is in their house. And that's basically what he says to him. He's going to grow up in your house. And here's the choice you have. And so he decides, you know what? If Mary has done this, I'm going to provide for her and for the Son of God, and I'm going to do everything I can to make this good. And so, no sex till after the baby's born. Wow, that's a long time. Especially in our day and time. Would you be willing to do that? Yeah, it would only be another nine months. It's easy to see how he would reach the conclusion he reaches. We never think our life is going to go like that. We never think our life would be, you know, where our son is the prophet, our son is the Messiah, our son is someone like that. And so Joseph is completely obedient to God and to doing what God wants him to do. He puts himself fully into this life that God has really chosen for him. We don't always see what God is doing around us, and I think that's one of the things that we miss Something significant can be happening right in front of us. It can have all eternity in that moment, and we don't even realize what's going on. It seems like a tragedy, but actually it's the plan of God, and we want to take it as one or the other. But I think we always have to assume God's about to do something amazing. 
And especially if you ever see anything that seems to be a tragedy. Maybe God's about to do something amazing because that's usually how amazing things start is with something that went wrong, something that doesn't seem right, something that's difficult to deal with. In Matthew 2, we'll talk about next week, the Magi come, they are looking for God. It's an amazing story. They said, we've seen his star in the east. They are astrologers. And uh, we've come and we're trying to find him. See, sometimes their eyes are closed. But their eyes were open. They were watching. They were watching stars. Would you see an extra star? I mean, really, if you walk out tonight, do you know, oh, there's a new one. Would you see that? But somehow they saw it. Somehow they realized it. Somehow they knew this belongs to a king. And so they come looking. And it's the reason why they come is because they had seen a star. It means a new king. It means a savior is born. But they come to Herod, and Herod is the guy who does not care anything about this, doesn't even know the prophecy, has to ask, what's the prophecy about this child? What's the prophecy about this king? And he gets the answer about Bethlehem. Not only that, but he seems very defensive about it. What, there's a new king born? How can that be? That's just not right. It seems like a threat to him, like he's going to take away his throne. What does he think? He's going to live forever? This is a child. By the time he gets to, yeah, but we get threatened by all kinds of things, and we miss what God's trying to say. He doesn't really want God with him. He's got his own kingdom. He doesn't want anybody else with him. He knows exactly what's supposed to happen. He's supposed to be in charge, and he doesn't need God. And all of this actually goes back to Genesis 12, a promise given to Abraham that all nations would be blessed in you by your seed, by your descendant. That's huge. And so if you want to put all the Bible together, it really comes down to taking the promises out of Genesis and looking at how they're fulfilled in Jesus and then looking at how that gets carried out in, in their time and in our time. And I think it's amazing when we begin to look and see and understand what it's all about. I want to encourage you to do Bible study. I want to encourage you to understand how these things fit together. I got to teach the, I think, fourth and fifth grade. And so we were trying to talk about tabernacle and about what that means and about why you would kill a lamb, and but they're cute. I said, well, that's what you have to realize. When you disobey, cuteness dies. And they were shocked. No, that's not possible. You got to study this stuff, guys. You got to understand what's going on. That's God's plan, and it is so much better now because Jesus was that cuteness for us. He was that person who came and died on a cross. And as he's born into the world, all of that is about to happen. I think we all have different understandings. Some people understand colors. And they can tell what matches. And you can see by their clothes when they come in, everything matches. Some people, if you go to their house, it all matches. Some of the rest of us, we're stuck with black and gray, okay? (laughs) We don't venture too far outside of that because there's a good chance it won't match. Some people can can tell you what cool shades are and warm shades and everything else, but the rest of us are just completely oblivious. We don't know that. Some people great at organization. They know how to organize things. They know how to put everything in their house. They know how to put everything in every single place where it's supposed to be. And they're great at organizing things. Some of us, not so much. Some people are great at making plans. They could plan everything. It doesn't matter what it is. We can put a man on the moon and he's able to walk around. How much planning does it take to put a man on earth who's from God? That's an incredible amount of planning. And so some of us don't get planning, right? And we just kind of 
miss all that and go, huh, how could that be? And that's the one question. How could that be? That's denial. If we want to know how, we're really not seeing it. We're saying, I don't believe it. We're saying it can't be real because I don't know how. So I want you to think about that for just a minute. Well, some of us, you know, have trouble at seeing different things. And so I think all of us have a little bit of blindness in one spot or another. One of the other passages is in John chapter 20. I wanted to go over with you today. And then we'll look at Nicodemus and, and talk about three different perspectives to what was happening around them. So Jesus has died on the cross and been raised. And he's appeared to some of the disciples. But Thomas wasn't there. And so Thomas didn't see it. Thomas doesn't know about it. He hears about it secondhand. We don't know why he wasn't there. There's no excuse given for him. We just know he wasn't there. So in John chapter 20 and verse 24, it says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. And so other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. And he said to them, unless I see his hands, the, in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Wow, that's strong. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again. And Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and he stood among them and he said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. And put your hand and place it in my side. It do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believed. What an incredible thing. Thomas is like, I don't know how that's possible. And if we don't know how, then it can't happen. And the how gets us stuck the most. That we would have to understand the process when we don't understand the rest of the processes going on around us. We probably don't know how to make rain. We can barely get things to grow. We, we don't know how to organize. We, we don't know how to make colors match. We, we don't know how to make someone happy. We don't know how to do a whole lot of things. And yet we look at the process of God and go, nope, can't happen. And yet we can see evidence and see results of other things around us. I won't believe unless I see the result of the violence. That's what he really says. I've got to see the result of the violence because I was there for the violence. And so let me see what that violence did to him. I want hands or fingers in the nail prints. Wow. You really want to do that? I, I mean, just go to the hospital and talk to somebody who's had surgery and say, let me take apart these stitches a little bit. I want to make sure... You really had surgery. Because these aren't healed up. They may show you their scar, but chances are it's not good for you to touch it. And Thomas is like, no, I got to touch it or else I'm not going to believe you had surgery. I'm just going to think you got stitches. And Jesus had told them all of this was going to happen. Every single bit of it. That's what he'd said. I'm going to be crucified. He had told them how. He had told them who. It's going to be the rulers of the Jews. Thomas didn't believe the other disciples even, much less Jesus. And he thought it was all over. Jesus is dead. I've already accepted that. I've already moved on. It can't happen. Unless I understand and can see the how. And then the last part of this passage in John it says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe 
that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that may believing you may have life in his name. These are written that you might believe. Do you have to know the how? If you have to, this is the best explanation we've got of here's why, and he does more explaining of the why than he actually does of the how, because I'm not sure the how helps us. It's the why that makes all the difference to us. Tragedy makes our focus too small. And so he's got to touch, he's got to be there, he's got to see this, he's got to, and he can't get past it. Illness is all you can see. It's really difficult because it focuses everything down to I've got this illness and you can't see anything but where you are and what's going on with you and you don't know why and you don't know how and how are we going to fix it and at times I think we're all doubters of Thomas I wish I could see this I wish I could touch it I wish I could explain the how and I think it's all because we're not looking how many things do you see that are significant and there are some significant things right in front of us so can we see our own children? Yeah, they're, they're, they're kids. No, those are not just kids. Those are the people who are going to pick your nursing home. <laughs> Think of it like that. Those are not just children. You better be on their good side because they're gonna grow up and they are going to run your life. And the little children that they bring to you out of that, it, you better hope that you train them right enough to train their own right. Because otherwise you're going to be left with a mess. So be aware of the significance of what is standing at your feet and how important that is. And especially how important that is that they would understand God. And that they would really be able to see who God is and what God is doing. What makes things real to us? There are a few things that happen like that. It is a tragedy when someone dies. And just practically, they will tell every single person, you need to go see the body. Why? Because we, we can't accept if we don't see it. And as soon as you see the body, you go, yep, they're not there. But somehow, if we don't touch it, if we don't see it, we can't quite grasp it. We're told someone has a baby. You still don't think of them as having a baby until you actually go and see them struggling with car seats and diaper bags and all this other stuff that they have to do in order to stop the child from screaming. It's, it's like required stuff, but we don't picture them like that because we've never seen them like that. And so you almost have to see them in the situation and go, oh yeah, you've got a baby. And someone tells us we're loved. Is it real? Do you believe it's real? How would you know? Well, there ought to be some evidence, right? Maybe you ought to say some nice things. Maybe there's a time when they were able to be nice to you. Maybe there's a time when there's more that goes on. Sometimes there's a ring. Why would we believe anything we're told? I mean, really. You can just look at the ring and go, that's Cracker Jacks, right? I know where you got that. I'm not going to fall for this. And you may lose that. There's all kinds of evidence around us. What makes us believe in gravity? I mean, you are sitting down, not floating up. So I'm assuming you're going to believe in gravity. Does it take studies that are done to make the difference? Does an infomercial help? I saw it on TV. I read it in the paper. You can't trust TV. Or, you know, the best one is, well, we saw it on the Internet, so it's got to be true. Everything on the Internet's true. God is doing significant things all around you today. 
Please don't miss those. Those are so important. The third one is Nicodemus as Jesus is approached by Nicodemus and he's so confused he does not know how to handle this. He does not know what's going on. There are some things he believes about this, but then there are more things he really doesn't quite get and doesn't understand. So it's not a tragedy that's just happened to him like Thomas. He's been studying the law all of his life, looking for Messiah. And boy, there are some things about Jesus because of the signs that he does. And he's not sitting in the place of prophecy where an angel has appeared to him and says, guess what? You're about to have a child, and it's not a surprise like that. And so in John 3, it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night, and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Okay, we saw the signs, so therefore we've come to a conclusion, a logical end, that God must be with you. Right? Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it and you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus said, huh? <laughs> okay, that, that part's not really in there, but you know, you, you gotta just imagine he's trying to catch up on all of this and he should know this stuff. He's, he's a teacher. He's a, one of the leading people of the Jews. He's, he knows all the law, and he knows enough to know that there are fulfilled prophecies happening here, that all of this is something that's important. There's a guy who's able to do signs. It has to be somebody from God. It's been 400 years. We haven't had anybody from God, and this looks like somebody from God, but it's confusing. It's confusing as trying to understand Dallas's communion talk and all of those magnetic things and no that was great Dallas thank you but some things we just we don't understand and Jesus says the reason you don't understand it is because you're on the outside you have to be born again to see it if you were on the inside it would all make sense but you can study it from the outside and try and figure out the how from the outside and you're going, this doesn't make any sense. How does church function? How does forgiveness happen? Let's do a study of forgiven people compared to non-forgiven people and rate their level of happiness or rate their level of forgiveness. How would you come up with a standard that said these people are 12% happier, these people are less guilty, these people are... Any study from the outside is not going to make any sense. And it just doesn't work for us. And yet that's how we approach Jesus a lot of times, is let me study it from the outside and, and I'll see if it's logical enough for me to be able to be involved in it. And a lot of times we walk away going, you know, I don't, I, I don't get it. If you focus on the fact that here's a guy who does signs and that God is doing something around you, figure out the why. That's more important is the why. And as they talk and as he tries to explain, he says this kingdom has to be seen from the inside. You enter it by this new birth. You enter it by this born of water and spirit, which we understand is going to be repentance and baptism and then receiving the Holy Spirit and so you're born of water and spirit here together and then you can see it from the inside and you know what it still does not make logical sense 
why people would care about each other the way that they do. Why they would see God the way that they do. Why they would love God. And we get stuck on the how because we can't figure out the how. Jesus says it's like the wind. You hear the sound. You see the leaves blow. You're glad it clears out the smoke and the clouds. It's cool on hot days. Do you know how? No, it's, it's, it's windy. That's all I know is it's windy and it blows stuff around and blows everything right back into my yard. <laughs> Do we understand how all the systems work? Not much. But we can see it. You can see the result of it. You can see what it does. Can you see the difference in a person who is born of the Spirit. In a person who has repented of sins, been baptized into Christ, and been filled with the Holy Spirit. Can you see that? And the logical person looks at that and says, nope, they don't look any different. And the spiritual person looks at that and goes, yeah, I can see it. There's a different kind of peace in their life. They act different. They think different. They follow a different person. You see, we could see Joseph as he took care of Mary. It isn't logical. There's no logic about it, but he believes an angel who says, this is what happened. I'm going to go with it. You're never going to get the how out of that one, okay? If you do, please explain. No, just keep it to yourself. I don't think I even want to know the how, but just that it happened, all right? It's there, it's real, and Joseph decides, I am willing to protect the mother of God and give them a place to live and to grow. That's my spot, that's my place. And so he believes the prophecy, and he took on what God wants him to do. Can we see new birth? Each time you come to the Bible, ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes. Each time you come to church, let the Holy Spirit open your eyes to be able to see some of the things that are here. Are there changes that occur after baptism? Absolutely. There ought to be. Please don't say you just got wet. See, we do change the way we think. We do change how we feel about mercy. We do things like worship and pray and extend grace. And there's a greater patience with each other. At least we know we ought to be more patient rather than just taking our own revenge and that there's more loving going on. Can you see grace? Can you see the love of God? Can you see forgiveness? But you can see the result in a person who has those things. And I doubt you could explain it. It's just the kind of person they are. But it's changed. It's different. It's new. Because you can see it from the inside. Can you see love? You can when you're in it. And everybody else says, I don't know how that happened. Can you tell when someone loves you? Yeah. Well, how? What are, what's the standard? Let's perform an experiment. This person who doesn't love me and this person who... There's no statistical analysis for this. So can you tell God is with you? If you can't, then it's time to do something about it. If you can't feel any grace from God, if you can't realize any signs, if you can't realize that any prayers have been answered, if you can't see how God is in the middle of the horror of this world making a difference, if you can't imagine Jesus who would give up his life for you, then we need to talk. You need to be able to see that God absolutely can be with you because that's what makes life good. That's what makes it all work. So if you need to start again with new birth, let's do that. 
If you need to start again with repentance, if you just need to start again with some kind of understanding, or maybe you just need to say, I just need to go with it and say, absolutely, God loves me, and I'm going to live for him, and I will take my place that God wants me to have. Well, if we're able to help you with that, if we're able to bring that about in your life, I want you to have that for sure. If you need to come, let's pray and talk. Would you come while we stand and sing?